pleased to introduce Dr. Zaina Albalawi, who is an endocrinologist. She completed her internal medicine and endocrinology fellowship at the University of Alberta and co-authored the foot chapter for the 2018 Diabetes Canada guidelines. Her clinical practice included limb preservation at the Diabetes Foot Clinic at the Royal Alexandra Hospital and diabetes and general, general endocrinology at the Regional Diabetes Program and Baker Clinic in Edmonton. Dr. Albalawi is a member of the Diabetes Foot Care Pathway Steering Committee through the Strategic Clinical Network in Alberta. Research interests include post-operative outcomes and limb preservation in individuals with diabetes. She obtained her Master of Science this year in Clinical Epidemiology at the University of Alberta. She relocated just a little ways out of the way to St. John's Newfoundland in Labrador this summer, where she'll continue working in the field of limb preservation and endocrinology. Dr. Albalawi is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada, and she's a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine and Endocrinology and Metabolism. Please welcome Dr. Albalawi. So, I don't really have any specific disclosures relating to this talk. I've had an honorary from her. And one disclosure, though, this is probably the very, the only foot talk that I will not be showing any pictures of any feet. And as some of my colleagues will later on, so I thought I'd showcase a little bit of Newfoundland and some of the bright colors that you don't have. So I want to share a narrative. I, I think it was very nicely set the stage for the burden of diabetic heat. And working in a multidisciplinary clinic, I always go <coughs> with my patients. I'm like, we have attachment issues. Once they come, as we've seen with the high recurrence rates, we tend to hold on to them. And the narrative that I've heard, and I'm curious if you've had a similar story, I feel that patients sense the betrayal. From this disease. On one hand, they're deprived of that protective sensation, they get ulcers, higher risk of amputation mortality, and then they're walking around with those heavy custom-made footwear indoors and outdoors, and the wife's always complain about the, wearing those indoors, especially in Alberta with all the, with our lovely weather. And then they come to bed, they want to have some rest, peace and quiet, but they can't even get the bed sheets over their feet. That hypersensitivity to pain is just so bothersome. Their feet are cold, but they can't cover them, and that burning and tingling is just so disturbing. Um, it, they're losing both ways. So I'm just curious, I'm just gonna pause here, but anybody heard any particular narrative relating to the pins and needles, which we'll cover, and then we'll dive into the topic. But any other narratives or any other um, comments you might have heard from patients about the peripheral neuropathy or symptoms of pins and needles. Yeah, go ahead. I've had situations where people, even though they've been able to lower their A1C and achieve certain targets, um, they still have neuropathy. So it's really the betrayal. You know, we worked hard and they still yeah. have the, the pain and, and, and yeah, pain on yeah, yeah. No, thanks a lot for sharing it. Absolutely. I, I don't know if anybody else has had that narrative where, where people feel they're working hard but really not seeing the results. And uh, I'll leave my spoiler alert to later. But yeah, we don't have a cure yet, but we'll touch on that for sure. So the three main objectives we're going to cover are, I think it's really important to develop an understanding of that natural history in the spectrum of peripheral neuropathy. And with that, when we're encountered with patients who are complaining of that or uh, running into issues, we at least have an understanding and we can help educate them and show them how that path looks. And then we'll move on to develop an understanding on the implications. So as healthcare providers in, in various areas, even though we're taking care of that open wound on the bottom of their feet, treating osteomyelitis, frequently patients come in and their main concern is that burning and tingling and numbness that's just making it difficult to walk. So once that's brought to our attentions as healthcare providers, what are the implications? And do we just say, yeah, empathize with them and move on, or is there something that we need to do? And finally, we'll come into the action plan of develop an approach of management um, of peripheral neuropathy and what's the next step. So I'll touch on some practical points there. So uh, this was just kayaking. I just got my level one kayak. Uh, hopefully, we'll navigate the, uh, the ocean over there. Uh, but I'm going to start with setting the stage first with, the, with uh, getting the definitions and the terminology out of the way. because both healthcare professionals and patients use different words interchangeably, so we'll just keep that consistent. Um, and then what's the significance, the morbidity from patient's perspective, but also from the healthcare system uh, as well. And we'll talk about management points. Again, spoiler alert, we don't have a cure, but we'll talk about, well, because we don't have a cure, I think it's important to emphasize the principles, what we do and why we do them. 
Uh, and then I'll just conclude with a poll, so we'll get you to get your apps ready. I'll guide you through that. We'll do a diabetic foot edition, Mythbusters. I don't know who watched that series, or I think I loved it. I watched probably some twice. Uh, but we'll do a, a brief one on diabetic feet. So starting with the definition, this is going to be just the first technical part. But I'll just cover it because I think it summarizes really the next couple of slides. So diabetic peripheral neuropathy, it's the presence of symptoms and or signs uh, of peripheral nerve dysfunction in people with diabetes after exclusion of other causes. So you can see from the definition, there's a clinical and a subclinical component. The talk's the title, Pins and Needles, and we're going to focus on that because that's what bothers patients. But not everybody with clinical neuropathy or symptoms of pins and needles will have abnormal findings on exam. So about 20% will, uh, will have uh, findings. But we know that over 10 years, about 50% will eventually develop peripheral neuropathy. So the natural history is that you might have it before the diabetes. That might be actually the symptom that brings on the diagnosis or triggers investigating for it. Um, and then usually by 10 years, 50% of people will have it. There are different types, but we're going to focus on the most common. So 50% is the glove and stocking pattern, which patients mostly complain of and which we're mostly familiar with, but it does go up to 75% as well. Uh, it's typically symmetrical, but there is also an asymmetrical uh, subtype. And so with that, there are the mononeuropathy. So you probably hear patients complain of carpal tunnel if the median nerve is affected or the ulnar nerve, or you can have cranial nerve palsies as well. And then less commonly, there are polyradiculopathies. Uh, examples would be the lumbosacral uh, roots when those are compressed. Um, but the most common one is the distal symmetrical stocking glove or the pins and needles that patients refer to. So what are the causes of peripheral neuropathy? We know diabetes is the most common, but there are other causes. And from the definition, it touched on it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So it's really important to recognize that. Uh, so you know, if your patient comes in and says, hey, I've, I've just turned vegan, because that's kind of the trend now, then, and then suddenly their peripheral neuropathy is worse or they can't sleep at night, you're probably thinking more along B12 deficiency or you want to look into that. So we also want to avoid, I mean, we know it's the most common, but we don't want to say any and every symptom is because of their diabetes. So being aware of those common factors is going to be important when patients are reporting those symptoms. Because you want to decide, is this something that you know, just uh, speak to your healthcare provider or family physician, speak to your wound nurse or whatnot about it, or do you need to refer on? So alcohol, HIV, associated neuropathy is also common. And then there are a number of medications which we actually use quite frequently with diabetes and treating infections. So metronidazole is one. Patients who are on chemotherapy can also have neuropathy. And then, because we have to give a name for everything, so when we don't find a cause, um, and it's not fully explained by the diabetes, there is a portion that's idiopathic where we don't have an identifiable cause. So symptoms, um, the timeline is really important. It's not going to happen overnight. So that's going to be one of the red flags to think about. Um, it usually is, is a grumbling history. So when you ask them, when they bring it to your attention, if you ask, you know, how long has it been going on, usually it's months to years. Uh, the symptoms typically symmetrical, burning, tingling, numbness. If they say pain, and I don't know if you've had this, but some patients just say, my feet hurt. So it's always worthwhile elaborating, what do you mean by pain? And usually if it's diabetic neuropathy, it reverts to either burning, numbness, or tingling, or so on. Um, and then typically it improves with walking, but we're asking them not to walk too much or uh, if we need to offload their feet. And it gets worse at night. Um, Red flag. So I'm just going to turn this question over to you. What would you, what would ring a bell in your mind that this is not following the typical pattern of peripheral neuropathy? Something doesn't make sense. Yeah. Worse when they're walking. Yeah, worse when they're walking. So what are you thinking typically if it's, uh, if it's worse when they're walking? Yeah, peripheral arterial disease. And, and again, 50%, that's a really important point because 50% of patients with neuropathic ulcers or peripheral neuropathy have ischemia as well. And so it's, it's important to differentiate what type of pain because the approach is completely different. Any other red flags or things that would kind of ring a bell in your mind and say, yeah, this does not smell, sound like diabetic neuropathy? Yeah. Yeah, following a specific dermatome or, or whatnot. And although you could get those with peripheral, well, the diabetic peripheral neuropathy, they're not the most common. 
exactly compression or with that. Yep, yeah, that's a good point there. So, so red flags, and that's our role as healthcare providers. So, and patients complain about that all the time. Uh, I'll just do a quick show of hands. How many people, first of all, work with people with diabetic feet, uh, either wounds or ulcers? Yeah, so I guess not surprising that you're here in this room today, but patients, that seems to be a frequent complaint and something that's quite bothersome to them. Um, and so being aware of those red flags will help at least direct them, yes, this is something you do need to speak to your, to your family physician about or, or speak to, uh, to a neurologist if it's, uh, if it's been investigated and it's not following the typical pattern or if it's progressing quite quickly, uh, or if you have a predominant motor component. So although peripheral neuropathy down the road, you can get weakness and the motor pathways are involved, early on it's predominantly sensory. Um, and then the asymmetry, which was pointed out, and the acute onset. So etiology, I will not, I'll probably just spend 10 seconds here, but I'll, I think it was worded very nicely by, uh, by one of the experts who we just uh, met at Diabetes Canada meeting. He said it's a heterogeneous mess in terms of the etiology. I think that sums it up. Um, it is an interplay of inflammation, um, metabolic derangement, and impaired supply to the nerves resulting in ischemia. And in the big picture, it's an imbalance between the nerve damage and nerve repair, uh, favoring uh, the former, the, uh, the nerve damage. Um, and it's predominantly axonal, so that's why we see it in, uh, in the legs initially, in the, in the long nerves, in the arms, and in the intercoastal areas, the other typical, um, typical place we see it. So another just quick point about the natural history is that there is the, the really bad peripheral neuropathy or the painful peripheral neuropathy can be transient and it typically resolves within 12 months. So there is that part of that natural history where it could peak and then it, would, it might settle on its own. Which is, and the reason I mention it, it's really important when we come to therapeutics and treatments, when we look at studies, it's very important to know that the duration was adequate to, to mimic or to take into account the natural history. Uh, but also it's important to have proper placebo and blinding because if, if you, I mean, some studies have been done just for a few weeks or whatnot or without proper placebo and you don't really know is that the effect of the medication itself or is it just the natural history was gonna resolve anyways. So moving on to the next point, what's the significance and morbidity? Um, it does range from discomfort that patients report um, and that is really important because patient-centered care and outcomes that matter to patients should matter to us from a clinical and research point of view. Um, and I won't touch on the mortality rates. I think that was very nicely highlighted. Um, but it starts with discomfort. Um, they are at risk for diabetic foot complications. Uh, that can result in open wound, uh, which could also result in, put them at risk for amputation. And once they've had the amputation, we've heard eloquently how they, they have higher rates of mortality. The reason I just put this together is to understand that it's not just a symptom of pins and needles or peripheral neuropathy. Um, it is um, a progressive disease, and it's just important to know where it fits within that cycle and what we're dealing with. So matters to patient, a number of studies have been done looking at how peripheral neuropathy and clinical peripheral neuropathy impairs quality of life, affects patient's sleep, causes anxiety, distress, days absent from work, um, as well as impaired activities of daily living. It also is associated with higher morbidity and mortality, as outlined kind of just by that simplistic graph over there, and we've heard the data, uh, but also the health expenditures. So it costs patients, and we've seen those figures as well, but it also costs the healthcare system. So um, diabetic foot, foot complications, or the most common admission in diabetes is, is for diabetic foot let me reword this. So the most common complication to require admission is peripheral neuropathy or diabetic foot complications. Now that's in the broad spectrum, so even osteomyelitis or, um, or an infection or being in hospital needing an amputation or surgical resection is also, I think, counted in that. Um, so that's the health expenditure point. And then if they do require an amputation, we've heard how the, the expenditure doubles uh, in this population. But also patients are needing to commute to those specialized centers, um, wound dressings, offloading devices, support that they need when they need to be off work. So the question that all patients are gonna ask, give me that magic pill that basically just gets rid of it. And we don't have a cure, but there are principles 
um, that we can follow that are important to prevent complications. So there's, there's extensive research being done. None has been promising, except for one, which I'll mention when I come to therapeutics, not a cure, uh, but showing some disease modification. Um, it, it's coming out of a group from uh, University of Manitoba, and trials will be starting in, in Toronto in 2019 in different areas in the States as well. Um, but for now, what we know is that the three main principles, once we've identified peripheral neuropathy, um, and specifically the pins and needles or clinical neuropathy, number one, disease-modifying therapy, including glycemic control. And I'll touch on the question that was brought, or the point that was brought on uh, earlier, is there is a difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So with type 1 diabetes from the landmark DCCT trial, we know that intensive glycemic control, early and tight control, reduces progression and onset of peripheral neuropathy. Now, most of our patients have type 2 diabetes. So looking at the type 2 diabetes data, that was more of a modest effect. So, so that's, I think that's, so, so that is the data that we have, and I think we need to let patients know so they don't feel that they're, um, they don't feel frustrated because it's still going to be important regardless, obviously, to get their hemoglobin A1C and glycemic control, um, to get it under good control. But we don't have data or strong data to say that this is going to stop or halt the progression of your peripheral neuropathy. But we certainly can hammer it down with, with type 1 diabetes. Uh, the other component is foot care prevention. So those patients, when they walk, they describe walking on like wearing thick socks. And so their balance and their pressure points are altered with that peripheral neuropathy, especially if they're having symptoms. And so prevention of fall and risk stratification is going to be important. And then we'll talk about the symptom relief. So for the foot care prevention, the risk stratification, I think the Alberta model, um, uh, which was developed by um, uh, the Strategic Clinical Network and the Working Group, which, are, which I think will be presented later on, um, it involves a very practical method to risk stratify and then based on that decide what to do. That was adapted from New Brunswick. Um, and then education on foot care, um, ensuring that they check their feet regularly because they are at risk. Um, and then educating them on preventing injury through offloading if it's indicated, if they have deformities, or chiropathy care as well. Now, for the, before I go through the medication, I'm just going to highlight a few points here. Um, I think the three important points that we should share with patients when they bring that to our attention about um, how they're disturbed by the pins and needles and symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. The first one is that that really bad, severe peripheral neuropathy tends to improve typically within 12 months. Uh, not to say we're not going to use symptom relief therapy, but that's, I think, where we should use it. But it's important to know that so that we can reevaluate the therapy and we might be able to take it off or uh, to minimize side effects. Uh, the second important point is that these medications do not cure. Uh, moderate response is considered a 30 to 50% improvement in symptoms using visual analog scales. So that's what most studies used. And then a good response is considered just slightly over 50%. So by no means is it 100% relief or even close to 90%. Again, some patients do experience that. Whether it's the natural history or the medication, um, it's unclear. Um, and the third point is that all these medications have side effects. And some of the common side effects, which we need to be well versed in when we're prescribing those medications and balancing it, um, making sure that it doesn't offset the benefit, is imbalance, dizziness, lower leg swelling, and most of these patients are older already, have balance issues, or might have had an amputation, and uh, proprioception is not completely there. So the two big categories where we have the strongest evidence and that are FDA approved are duloxetine, so the antidepressant group, the very first one at the top. Uh, and, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, so amitriptyline is also an option. It does have more side effects. Uh, so the better choice would be duloxetine. I'll just mention the trade name here because you're probably familiar with it and patients name it. So that's uh, Cymbalta. Uh, and then from the anti-seizure, anti-convulsant group, we have a number of medications. The one that's FDA approved and has um, strong evidence is pregabalin, which is Lyrica is the trade name for that. Um, there are others within that category. I'll, I'll mention it. Gabapentin is used widely. It's, a very, it's very controversial. There are lots of issues with robustness of the evidence and whether it truly offered a significant difference. A systematic review done um, by the Cochrane Group showed that it didn't really, um, it wasn't much better than, than placebo. However, 
I'm sure you've had patients, and I've had patients who swear by it, even just by 300 or 600 milligrams, which is not even the kind of therapeutic dose, and they sleep like a baby and they're happy. So, I mean, that's anecdotal evidence, but um, it is an economic option, and many times cost is also prohibitive or the side effect profile. Many patients, 50% of patients with diabetes have depression, so they might already be on it. So it's very important to review and have that done with a healthcare provider who's, who's uh, familiar with those medications and their side effect profile. So other options, Tylenol, uh, opioids we avoid unless absolutely necessary or we're addressing neuroischemic pain or we have refractory uh, pain. And then there's limited evidence for some other options like, like IV lipoic acid, opioid analgesics, and inhaled marijuana, which I'm not sure if your patients might be asking you about. The one that's quite exciting uh, that's coming down the pipeline uh, that I mentioned earlier is a medication that's already FDA approved uh, for overactive bladder. It works on the antimuscarinic receptor. And the trial that are going to be launching next year, so just stay tuned for those. Uh, they've shown promising initial results, and we'll see how it performs with the trials. The drawback is, though, it does cause cognitive impairment, and so um, long term. So we still don't know how that's going to look. So I'm just going to move quickly. To, we'll, I'll have you get your apps ready. We'll just take one quick minute to go through a few. Um, let me just get my pulsation. So I'll have you go into the app. Just go into the schedule at the top left of the app. And once you click on the actual talk, you'll have at the very bottom options for a poll. So I'll start with the first one. Um, I think I'll put it up here. Uh, so majority of patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy uh, or pins and needles need an EMG or they need to see a neurologist at some point in time. I'll we'll give you about 15 seconds here if you can put in your thoughts what do you think do most people need that as part of the diagnostic process. So 70% say that they don't, and some people um, have voted that they do. And it is a diagnosis of exclusion, and it is a clinical diagnosis. So most patients do not require an EMG uh, if it follows the typical pattern. But at any point, as was highlighted, if they, um, if they don't follow the typical pattern or um, they're getting worse or they have some of the, those red flags, certainly referring them on. Uh, but that would be in a small portion of patients. I'll just do, maybe I'll pick the marijuana one because I think that's a hot topic and then we'll conclude with that. Uh, so medical, we'll just move on to the second one. So in your app, you just have to go down to the second poll. Uh, but the statement that we're trying to see if it's true or false is medicinal marijuana is effective in management of diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And if you can multitask and you have two hands, how many patients get asked that by their patients? Yeah, so there is a few and I've had it quite a bit, especially over the, over the past year. Excellent. So I kind of said effective, meaning that you know we have the evidence and it's strong. There are a couple of studies. So I agree with the poll, 71% false and 29% true. Um, there are two studies, probably the better ones that have been done, one in 2010, one in 2015, looking at different preparations, very small studies, uh, one in 2010 looking at um, uh, uh, marijuana showed that there was no significant change compared to placebo, but that was in a very small study, about uh, 43 patients. And the most recent one was only a six-hour study looking at the effect of inhaled marijuana. So it's not robust study yet, and we don't have evidence for that. So I apologize for going over time here. Um, I'll conclude uh, just saying that. Just put... The, just the main summary points uh, from peripheral neuropathy is that uh, it is common, but there are other causes. Uh, so we need to think about it and just be aware of that natural history. Um, understand the red flags and when we need to refer to a specialist. Um, and then there is no definitive treatment. I think we need to communicate that to patients. But the three main principles are optimizing diabetes control for everybody, but the evidence is for type 1. Uh, pharmacotherapy is for symptom relief, so only if it's affecting their sleep or walking, not a treatment for everybody, and then preventing falls.
So thank you very much. And uh, I'll leave my contact info for later if anybody has any questions. Thank you.